125 through 17. Because the foolishness of God is brighter than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see that your calling brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not, my, not, many, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty. The things which are mighty. Thank you, Brody. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. I don't think I say that often enough that I, I, I really just get kind of overcome sometimes at the, the privilege of, of what, I'm, what I'm doing up here. It, it, it is a privilege, and uh, I, I'm really glad that you're here and that I have this opportunity. So thank you just for that. Has God ever asked you to do something that you thought was foolish? Well, if you've ever read the Bible, the answer is probably yes. You won't get too far before you'll find something that has you scratching your head and second-guessing God. Now, when I say foolish, I mean foolish by human standards. Uh, but has God ever asked you to do something that was uncomfortable or un felt unnatural to you? You know, things like loving your enemies, turning the other cheek. If someone steals your coat, give them your shirt. It just sounds very contrary to human nature. But God himself is contrary to human nature. As you said through Isaiah, my ways are not your ways. He's different than we are. And sometimes when our judgment about something doesn't match with God, we'll, we'll have a tendency to try to second guess him or try to wriggle out from underneath that command. We don't have any problem, it seems, with the, the easy command when when we're told to, you know, be bold witnesses for Christ, be prophets, speaking the gospel. Uh, we're, we're commanded to be priests in the kingdom, offering spiritual sacrifices of song and prayer. Commanded to be servants, and to all of those we say, yes, we will, Lord. And then when he says, and I want you to be foot washers, and we say, yeah, okay, I guess, and we start balking at commands when they begin to challenge our pride. What we think we ought to be doing. What we think is best in that situation. Our own judgment gets in the way. And that must be frustrating to God. We're going to be looking at one example of, of that attitude today. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to learn about a man named Naaman. And I really love the story of Naaman because there is a, a lot of good, valuable truth there for us. And he's just one example of many that found themselves in a, in a bit of conflict with what they thought was right and what God was telling them to do. And I, I love the story of Naaman and I appreciate it, not just because it's an example of the wrong kind of attitude that we ought to avoid, not just the fact that Naaman is very relatable in those moments when we are not acting the way we should. But what I appreciate about the story of Naaman is that he also teaches us how we need to respond in those situations and how we need to grow in our faith. It's so helpful and so encouraging in the Bible sometimes when it doesn't, God doesn't just simply tell us what we need to do. But he shows the process of real, live people going through those steps. And what we see is we get to experience his name and his growth here and all the, the difficult stumbling blocks that he goes across. And I find those examples to be very encouraging. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, the first 19 verses of the passage we're going to be considering this morning, and we'll see that Naaman's example shows us how we can move from an immature and a shallow faith into true faith. And we do that by putting away our pride. Beginning in chapter one of Na uh, or beginning in verse one of chapter five, Second Kings. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. 
because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on rage and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus says the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was when Elisha, the man, of her, uh, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So we'll begin by looking here in Naaman that he was a very impressive man. And we see that he had a level of faith, but to begin with, it was an immature faith, you know, a childlike faith, very ignorant. Now, that's a terrible word, it just simply means he didn't have the knowledge. So consider Naaman's situation and what provoked him to do this. He didn't know God himself, he didn't know the one true God, the Lord Jehovah, but he trusted his servant, the servant girl. He trusted her. So this says a lot about Naaman. First of all, we see that the king was very impressed with Naaman. And to have a man as the commander of the armies and still be a leper, he must have been very effective. So it seemed that he was a very impressive man, but even more importantly, the, the, the testimony of this little girl who had been captured as a prisoner of war, we might say, and taken into the house of Naaman, it would have been very easy for her to you know, wish ill upon this man that had taken her away from her family. But it, it must have been that he was kind to her and treated her well, so much to the point that she said, Oh, I wish that my master Naaman was only in Israel because there's a prophet there and he could heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman had faith enough to go to his own king and say, This is what this girl told me. There's a prophet that could heal me. Would you allow me to go? That would have been a bold thing for a man to say. He's going to a heathen king, and he says, I want to leave here and go into the land of this conquered territory and worship their God so that I can be healed and see this prophet. That was no small request. The name is already showing some faith. And if you were to look on a map and see the capital of Syria was Damascus, and if you were to measure from Damascus to Dothan, which is where in Samaria... Elisha was, was living, it's about 100 miles. That's not, I mean, that's, you know, that's an hour and a half on the interstate for us, but it would have been a long journey. So we need to give Naaman full credit for his faith that is driving him to make this trip. And we see that his faith, I, I call it immature, because he's setting his sights too low. He's going to seek physical healing. He wanted to be healed of his leprosy. Now, leprosy was nothing to sneeze at. It was a deadly disease. It was incurable uh, by medical means at that time. But that's what he was seeking after. But he's only seeking physical healing when he really needs something more. And I want you to remember what Elisha says in verse 8. When he tells the king of Israel, he said, go ahead and send him on to me. And when he gets done talking with me, he's going to know that there is a prophet of the one true God in Israel. So there's a transition here from his, his faith is immature, but it, it begins to get a little bit deeper, and yet it's still very shallow. It is still a shallow faith, beginning in verse 9. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the, at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. 
But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the, the Abana and the far part of the rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So he got mad. This was not the response he was hoping for. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus told the parable of what we call the parable of the sower. There was a man who was a planter, a sower, and he had a bag of seed, and he's this tells him about how he's, he's throwing his seed everywhere. Some of it went in the weedy ground, and some on the stony ground, some on the hard path, and some in the good soil. The stony ground, or the shallow ground, it's not that, that the dirt had lots of rocks in it, but the idea is that there is a thin layer of dirt over a bedrock foundation there, and it's not going to allow much to be grown. I remember my grandfather saying something unique about the soil in Kansas. He had a, they had a garden out, in the, out by, by the horse lot. They lived out in the country, and he had a, a garden. Um, and it had, really, it had real sandy, loamy soil. But he said, you get down, if you're digging a fence post or something, trying to put a fence post in, you get down about 18 inches of dirt, and you would hit what they call the Kansas hard pan. And it's hard-packed dirt, and it's, I mean, it's as good as rock. You, you, you're not going to get through it very easily. That's sort of what Jesus was, was saying here. There's a little layer of soil, a little dirt. You can plant something, it'll start to grow, but the roots won't be able to go down very deep. And he said that these are the people who hear the gospel and it's implanted within them. Of course, he explained the, the parable. The gospel is the, the word, uh, or the gospel is the seed. It's planted, it takes root, but the, seeds, the, the roots don't go very deep. And as soon as you get a big windstorm or a drought that comes along, and the plant dies. That's what happened to Naaman. So he had a little bit of faith here, and now he's been challenged, and he's mad. And he stomps away in a huff. But the reason for that is because Naaman had a misconception about how he would be healed. He had this all planned out in his mind. He's, he's taking this journey from Damascus, and he's thinking about how these events are going to unfold. He said, I'm going to get there, and the prophet's going to come out, and... The prophet is in Israel. Israel is a conquered nation at this time. And Naaman is the commander of the army. This guy's going to be, he better be bowing and scraping on his knees, asking for my good favor. And he'll certainly do me this favor. Because the Syrians were over them at this time. So he's a man of great authority. He's the commander of the whole army. He's, a, he's an important guy. He's a big shot. So he says, I'm going to go and this prophet's going to come out and he's going to prostrate himself before me and he's going to, he's going to heal me and he's going to make a big show. He's going to call and, and, and holler out to his God and he's going to wave his hands all over and make a big production out of this. And it's going to be very impressive and then I'll be healed. This is how he's got this all planned out. He said, this is not what I had in mind. Have you ever heard someone say, be careful what you pray for because you just might get it? Sometimes we have a misconception about how God is going to answer a prayer or, or handle a situation. It's not what we had in mind. And sometimes it, it really takes us aback. That's what's happened to Naaman here. Many times when God doesn't respond how we thought he would, we're disappointed and even angry and upset. You know, it's as if you go to a restaurant and you order something and all of a sudden they bring you out a completely different meal and you say, this is not what I had in mind. This is not what I ordered. So the problem with Naaman here is that he is refusing to do something that to him seems foolish. You want me to go dip seven times in this dirty, grungy old Jordan River? Well, that's stupid. Why would I do that? I've got We've got better, cleaner rivers back in... Damascus. Why couldn't just wash in one of them? If it's just a matter of washing in a river. So he's upset. And he said, I'm not going to do this silly seeming thing. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm not going to do it. I've wondered many times about how this all came down when Joshua got the battle plan for Jericho. God has brought 
Israel out of Egyptian bondage. They've wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses and Aaron have died off, and now Joshua is in command of the Lord's people. And they've come right to the edge of the Jordan River. They've come there to the city of Jericho. <laughs> and this is going to be the first conquest of the promised land. So the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua. He says, Joshua, I'm going to give you the battle plan for Jericho. And I was. Imagine, you know, Joshua taking out his, you know, pen and paper probably would have been more like a, you know, a, a nail and a pottery shard or something. But, you know, he's got his, he's got his note. All right, lay it on me. What's this battle plan going to be like? And God says, okay, I want you to, I want you to march around the city of Jericho. Okay. Okay. And then, do what? And God says, that's it. Just march around the city. Okay. And for the next six days, yeah, yeah, march around the city again. Okay. But on the seventh day, oh, here, all right, here we go, here we go. Seventh day, yes, yeah, seventh day. What do you want us to do, Lord? I want you to march around the city seven times. What? All right. And after you march around the city seven times, yeah, yeah, blow the trumpets. Have the priest blow the trumpets and everybody shout real loud and the wall will fall down. I have to imagine Joshua, who was no stranger to battle. They had fought some battles. He wasn't a, a military genius by any stretch, but even Joshua probably would have been, Are you sure, Lord? That no no catapult, no battering ram, no no siege towers. Just march around the city. Well, what if Joshua had refused to do that? If he just said, that's just stupid. That doesn't make any sense to me. How are we going to defeat the city by marching in circles? Ridiculous. If Joshua would have refused to do that, what would have happened? Well, it would have gone back to the desert probably for another 40 years and tried for a third time with their grandchildren. But Joshua submitted to God's will, and it happened exactly as God said it would. But we really get into trouble when God doesn't answer the way we thought he would. But luckily for Naaman, he had another good servant, the servant girl, who had told him about the prophet, was doing him a great service. But there was another servant that Naaman had that had come with him on this trip. See, Naaman didn't go all by himself. He had his servants. He probably had some soldiers, you know, um, maybe a dozen or so of them, make a, make a good show of it. And we already, we already read how he's brought all this gold and silver and, and these changes of clothing. I mean, he's got a wagon or two or however many it would have taken. So he's got a bit of an entourage with him. And one of his servants sees Naaman, you know, stomping off in a fit, pouting, and he stops him. And he's going to help him move from this immature and shallow faith into a true faith. In verse 13, it says, And his servants came to him and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and he came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And his name and his urging Elisha to take this gift. And Elisha is saying, No, I don't want your gift. So Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Rimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimon, when I bow down in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him 
a short distance. So Naaman finally develops true faith. And we see that that is manifested in his life changes. His life has changed drastically. He's been healed. There's a big change. But it was he was healed because he repented and obeyed. He stopped stomping away from God. Stopped and he turned around and said, Okay, I will submit myself to your command. I'll do what you've asked me to do. And he showed his gratitude for that healing, that salvation really. He showed his gratitude and he offered gifts. Now he hasn't come as a conqueror. But he keeps referring to himself as your servant. He's talking to Elisha. And by proxy, talking to God, he's saying, you're, I am your servant now. I'm not, the, I'm not the commanding general. I'm your servant. And he's saying all of this in front of the people that are with him. He's unashamed to confess this humility, this servitude and obedience before the entourage that is gathered with him. They're hearing him say, there is no God in the world except in Israel. All other gods are false gods. Only the God of Israel is the one true God. That is a bold and dangerous statement for any man to make, but certainly a man in Naaman's position. But in this very short passage of time, we see that Naaman has counted the cost. You remember Jesus had warned those who sought to follow him. Those who would enter the kingdom of God, he said, you need to count the cost to be my disciple. If you're going to follow me, you need to think about how it's going to affect your life. Naaman's already thought about this. Things are happening very quickly. He says, I'm not, when I get back home to Damascus, I'm not going to worship all those false gods anymore. They're not real. So he has turned away from idols. As a matter of fact, he even asked for two mule loads of dirt. What in the world is he going to do with this? Why does he want dirt to take all the way back? It seems that he's going to build a new altar. He said, I'm not going to worship all those false gods on those false altars anymore. I'm going to worship the one true God. And he wants, he wants dirt. What he now sees, perhaps in some way, as, as holy ground. I want to take some of this hallowed dirt from Israel and take it back with me so I can have you know, a little bit of this. So I can build this new altar. He's making some radical changes. I mean, we can just go through his, his, uh, his change here and just count off the elements of true faith. We've got repentance, obedience, gratitude, good works, you know, fruits of repentance, humility, abandoning his old sinful life. Naaman was saved. He was converted. Naaman learned... To humble himself and to obey. And in doing so, he got far more than he hoped for. He exceeded his own expectations. Why did he go to Israel to begin with? Well, he had leprosy and wanted to be healed. So he went seeking physical healing, but instead of just finding healing, he found the healer. He found the one true God. He got more than he bargained for. And that's God's style. That's the way God operates. He always goes over and above what we think. Naaman even exceeded Elisha's expectations. Remember I asked you to keep in mind verse 8, what Elisha said when he told the king, don't worry about this, it'll all work out fine, send it to me. And when he gets through dealing with me, he's going to know there's a prophet in Israel. Elisha hoped that he would know that there was a prophet of God in Israel, but Naaman had come to know not just the prophet, but God himself. And he now had a mature faith. So the application the lesson for us there is that if we will put away our pride and trust in God's wisdom, then our faith will grow and mature as well. And you'll come to know God like never before. Like you never thought possible. It may be that you've never heard what you need to do to be saved. Or to be healed of your sins. You need to repent. Confess Jesus as Lord. 
to be baptized, immersed in water as Naaman was, for the forgiveness of your sin, as we're commanded in the New Testament. Or maybe you have heard it, but like Naaman, you've rejected it, or you've put it off because of pride or some other excuse. Or it may be that you've heard it and that you've even obeyed it. But your pride is keeping your faith from maturing and deepening. So if pride or any other problem is standing between you and a, and a deep intimate relationship with your God, then let us help you draw near to Him today if we can. Let us pray for you and encourage you and support you in any way that we can. Make that need known to us as we come and stand and sing this song. Please come. I bring 